thank you for your introduction. Uh, I'm happy to present the results uh, from this design and uh, from a wine, uh, SNP array for uh, cattle. So first I want to give you a background uh, because you probably not all of you are familiar with cattle breeding and what's going on in cattle breeding today. So everything in cattle breeding relies uh, on artificial insemination. Uh, that means the sires have daughters across herds and based uh, on this structure, you are able to estimate added genetic values um, for the sires, uh, which means uh, we're using linear mixed models and we're trying to estimate the additive genetic value. So we are trying to correct the phenotype, basically the phenotype, which is basically recorded on farm level by any environmental uh, effects to get the additive genetic value. And that's what we are uh, dealing with in uh, cattle breeding. So we, use, we are using now these so-called traditional breeding values uh, in any genomic selection model. Um, so we're using them and try to estimate so-called SNP effects for uh, uh, we're estimating those SNP effects using a genome-wide uh, spread marker uh, map. And we are not uh, dealing or we're not trying to um, answer the question who is or which is the causative variant. So we are trying to um, spread over the map, uh, over the whole genome, and try to estimate the SNP effects, which is subsequently used in uh, for the to predict the young animals, um, because the genomic EBVs, the so-called genomic EBVs, are more accurate than the pedigree uh, EBVs uh, for the young animals. So, this is the basic uh, scheme in cat breeding today. Uh, we have this scheme in Switzerland since 2011. Uh, we have been using for this routinely um, commercial available uh, chips so far. And last year we have decided to move to move one step further and design our first um, custom chip. So the second background which is necessary for this talk uh, is a national project. Uh, so far since 2011, uh, the cattle breeders have been setting up a large scale genotype up archive. They have been uh, genotyping intensively young animals uh, to select uh, and uh, to use them in, in their breeding scheme. So we have now a large-scale genotype archive which can be used for uh, additional work and for, for example for uh, a screening of specific haplotypes where we see uh, a missing or a reduced homozygosity. So windows where we see um, a deviation from Hardy-Weinberg uh, equilibrium. So we did this uh, screening uh, in all of our four main populations. I forgot to introduce, they are brown Swiss, dual proposed breeds, Original brown fee and Simmental. I'm not able to present any results um, from, the t uh, from this uh, project in this talk today, but if you're interested in, feel happy and go back. Uh, to my EAAP presentation uh, last year in Ghent. So these uh, two um, background slides I have to give you. Uh, and inside this uh, national project, we have been generating uh, whole genome sequence data. Um, and we are were now interested, or before the chip design, we were interested in uh, to get a large number of newly detected uh, variants genotyped uh, in the, the populations. So what were the aims and the requirements for the chip? Um, there was one uh, main goal. It was uh, we wanted to have a single array which meets all of our needs. So this array had to fit uh, uh, and had to be compatible with uh, historical genotype data in terms of everything. So it had to be it had to enable each check, uh, each monitoring uh, pipeline which has been done before. Uh, it should be, uh, a, or it had to be uh, compatible with the known recessive traits. So we were, uh, the, the breeders asked for uh, specific traits, mainly recessive traits called known from the OMIA database. Uh, and um, we wanted to genotype uh, the large number of newly detected uh, variants under the umbrella of the routine uh, genotyping uh, platform are sending up the samples and we want to screen them 
or to use these samples to screen our newly detected variants in our system. And of course, last but not least, thing had to be highly efficient in terms of the workflow and also in terms of the cost. Especially, let me mention that we uh, had quite a high number of new markers we wanted uh, to genotype and to screen in our uh, populations. What were the milestones uh, towards this new chip? So, in winter 2018 19, we, had, uh, we have started everything. Uh, and we had some international calls with the labs and um, the companies and technologies. And at the end of the winter, we have taken the decision to move forward to the Axiom uh, genotyping uh, platform. A couple of months later, so in July 2019, we were able to finish uh, the array, which we now call uh, Swiss Cow Array. Uh, I'm going to present it in detail uh, further on, but it's basically a 300k uh, array where we combine 100k archive markers together with um, more than 200 no, new, newly detected uh, markers. In, uh, from October 2019 till January 2020, so more or less uh, three or four months, we were busy uh, to validate the chip, so quite a long time. But this was necessary because uh, we have clearly uh, the match between the newly uh, generated genotype data and based on, for us, it's a new technology. It had to fit perfectly uh, and had to enable everything uh, which was known before in our uh, pipeline. So we were looking at the concordance towards the Illumina genotype archive. We were looking at the repeatability. And uh, last but not least, uh, Switzerland is part, uh, depending on breed, on several international um, genotyping plat um, platforms. So mainly the Holstein is a uh, member of the CDCB uh, exchange and the Brown Swiss is member of the Interpol exchange. So we had to run through a international validation as, as well. At the end, in January 2020, uh, we were able to uh, go live and submit the first uh, routine samples uh, being genotyped on the chip. So a slide about the, the chip design. Um, basically, as I said, initially, we are combining archive markers. So these are the markers that have been genotyped already before with the commercial available chips. They are, of course, selected on genome-wide level. We are combining them with the whole set of new markers shown in the chart here on the slide in black or in gray. And these new markers can be divided into two sections. On the one side, they are uh, markers uh, from the regions that came uh, out from the project of the haplotype screening. So there we selected any marker uh, independent from any variant effect prediction. But uh, we added to this section a third uh, section shown in the middle um, of the slide and we selected on genome-wide level, so independently from the regions from the haplotype screening. On genome-wide level, we selected protein-changing variants, um, uh, independently from any uh, of the protein uh, being affected. So, uh, setting up an archive um, of the protein-changing variants in the Swiss uh, cattle uh, breeds in the subsequent genotyping. In terms of the validation, um, so what did we look at uh, when we uh, were busy with the validation steps? Um, basically, we were looking at the concordance towards the Illumina genotype data. So that means uh, the validation samples have been uh, genotyping, um, uh, had been genotyped before with the uh, historical uh, commercial available chips. We have been genotyping uh, the validation samples twice. So we were able to look at the repeatability uh, uh, inside of our Swiss cow chip. We were looking at the sex check. Uh, we were looking at uh, the results from the causal variants. We had some CNVs um, uh, also on the chip, also apart from the causal variants. And last but not least, we were looking at the parentage testing, parentage testing on genome-wide level, uh, for uh, which we are using for the search for the parents and on Isaac marker level, uh, which is used for uh, the testing of um, specific parents. 
So I don't want to load you with some uh, with big with big numbers or large uh, slides, but then in, in the end we ended up in a repeatability and uh, as well as in an, a concordance towards the archive uh, genotype data above 99%. We had a reliable sex check, we had a reliable search for parents, uh, we had the parentage test so validated, and we had uh, validated the known causal variants, and as well we were able to pass the international chip uh, validation at the uh, CDCB. So coming now to the data, what kind of data or what's the, how many samples do we have uh, now uh, genotyped on this chip? As I said, we started in January. We have a clear seasonal effect in Swiss carving. So uh, Swiss carving mostly occur in autumn. So we had the disadvantage that uh, some of our carvings uh, were not genotyped. Uh, since they were born before. But however, we have till today more than 10,000 um, genotype samples on this chip. Uh, they are coming mainly from Brown Swiss uh, and Holstein uh, and subsequently by, by the dual proposed breeds. Of course, the numbers are representative for uh, the site population, uh, the Swiss cattle in total. So let's. Um, Let's now uh, have a look at the results. Um, and I started the results um, focusing on some selected recessive traits. Um, and in terms of the recessive traits, we have two types. Those that were known before and that, that were genotyped before. And the second group uh, of recessive traits are they uh, that were published before or not known before. Uh, we have been submitting the array and uh, we did not have previous genotypes. And I'm going to show you four examples here. The first one, uh, the so-called uh, RDEC, is a uh, degeneration of the retina in the eye, published in 2016, so before we have been submitting the array. But it was never included in our uh, chips before, so we were not aware of any um, um, frequency, of any early frequency in our populations. Uh, the second one uh, is a male fertility related uh, variant. It came into the essay based on the personal communication on national level. Published uh, in the autumn of 2020, um, it's highly uh, frequent in uh, Brownsville, for example. And the last one, the last two records, so so called OH1 or HH6, they have been. Um, uh, published, um, they have been identified after we have been submitting uh, the array, uh, but they entered into the array through the genome section of protein changing variants, since the first one is a moderate impact variant and the second one, HH6, is a high impact variant. So these are two examples about uh, the the gain um, or about the benefit uh, from, from the selection here, from this variant. Uh, uh, section here. Um, we were aware that most or that a large number of the those new variants that we have that we have been detecting in our project are probably false positives. So uh, we see this uh, when we look at the allele frequency distribution. We see a clear different pattern uh, in terms of the protein changing variants um, for the uh, when we compare it to the archive markers, so lots of them are fixed. See this, uh, they have uh, allele frequency 0 or 1. However, in the median section of each population uh, bar plot, you see that there's quite a large number of um, variants uh, that show segregation of our, uh, in our uh, national populations. Um, when we look at the quality criteria, uh, so I start with the core rate. Uh, in our more than 10,000 uh, genotyped uh, samples, now we see a extremely high core rate. Almost uh, all of the protein changing variants, I'm only focusing on them uh, on the slide as well, are called higher than 95%. Um, percent. And you see the same uh, high quality um, results when you look at the Mendel and the Mendelian errors um, on the protein changing variants. So in total, we have almost 50k um, protein changing variants genotyped on this chip uh, where we don't see any uh, Mendelian error. Uh, and the distribution of the 
other um, markers uh, and number of Mendelian errors is shown um, on the uh, on the bar plot on the right part. Let me come now to the uh, results from the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. We tested each variant uh, of our um, genotypes in terms of the, uh, any deviation, significant deviation from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And we see a population-specific picture. So we see several hundreds uh, of uh, variants that show significant, Hardy -Weinberg, significant deviation from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Uh, however, we see a number of 44 um, markers that uh, are common uh, across the populations in terms of the significant Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And this will be for sure um, a project, or this will be uh, analyzed uh, in, our, in detail, what's going on there. I have to say that uh, it cannot be the case uh, due to the, some parentage issues, because um, markers that... Um, have more than 2% of median errors are excluded from this analysis. Last but not least, um, I want to give you a forecast, and the forecast is the third area I want to touch. Uh, it's the accuracy of genomic prediction. Uh, this is mainly of um, the main topic or the, the main goal when why we genotype. We want to achieve a high accuracy of genomic prediction. Uh, for the young animals, so the the uh, the prediction, um, the validate the, the reliability of the um, preselection should be should be high. Uh, this is a work which is still ongoing, so I'm not able to present any results of the gain of this new chip uh, in terms of this um, part of the results. However. Uh, it is known from literature that it is beneficial to include um, real causative variants instead of uh, just uh, putting a genome-wide selected uh, dense marker set uh, in, and use them in genomic predictions. So what did we, uh, to uh, get an idea about the benefit from, the, from this chip here, we imputed the whole uh, genotype archive and I forgot to mention this in the beginning. For brown physics, for example, we have 80,000 uh, of genotype samples till today. Uh, we imputed the whole archive um, using uh, F-impute software onto our Swiss cow density and then repeated or run single snip regression models where we corrected for any stratification using the genomic uh, relationship matrix uh, in order to identify uh, QTL regions, so regions where we see uh, a major gene effect towards uh, a trait, uh, a trait which is uh, routinely uh, available from routine phenotype recording in cattle. So fertility traits, uh, birth traits, carcass traits, or milk production traits, of course. And we compared the results from this uh, from this um, single SNP regression models uh, with uh, the results from the single SNP regression models from the routine uh, system. So uh, to get uh, to give you an idea where the the QTLs are located uh, in terms of the chromosome and the region of the chromosome, just uh, I wanted to to uh, highlight um, them by red uh, the red dots on this uh, genome uh, picture. But uh, the most important thing is uh, we compare compare now the results from both uh, single SNP regression models. And we look in each uh, GWAS, uh, in each QTL region, whether the, the mostly, most significantly associated SNP is the same or whether it's a different one. Uh, and you see in the third um, column from left uh, that there's quite a high number of uh, QTL regions where uh, the SNP, the, mostly, the most significantly associated SNP is a different one compared to the results from the, from the routine model. Uh, finally, a proof of concept. Uh, there are some few QTLs in cattle breeding known uh, where, we, where we know the real causative role of the variant. And one example is the, uh, the DGAT. The moderate impact variant of DGAT K232 towards A variant. And in fact, we see this. We have this variant on the Swiss cow chip, but we don't have this uh, variant on our routinely uh, genotype archive. And what we see here is we see it's the mostly 
uh, most significantly associated uh, SNP in that region uh, with uh, the trade fat yield. So that's a nice proof of concept. It was somehow expected, but uh, however, it's nice that we have uh, been achieving this result. There's a second example, and this example comes uh, more or less from a different uh, background. It's the last uh, row in this table. It's the loss of function mutation in the APOB gene, uh, which is responsible for the recessive disorder cholesterol deficiency known in Holstein. Uh, and we see here we have been identifying basically this region, uh, SQTL, uh, towards a trait uh, called rearing success uh, heifer period Y. So this is the, the rearing success, or you call it rearing loss during um, uh, rear rearing the, the cow as a, the heifer. Uh, in routine, in the routine system, we have been um, seeing the QTL on chromosome 11 at uh, 80 megabase pairs. Um, it's quite a big shift by more than two megabase pairs, but we see uh, um, also on chromosome 11. So the, the, the loss of function mutation is the variant in that area, which is the as the shows the strongest significant association. So a second proof of concept, but a different um, background where it comes from. And all the other rows uh, in this table um, are um, variants where we see that the variant uh, or the, the mostly significant, the most significantly associated region uh, in that it was the trade is a different one, but it was never published before. So in summary, um, we had uh, a, let's call it a straightforward error design dialogue uh, together with the colleagues of uh, Temo Fischer, uh, namely Fabian Granke, who was a um, big uh, help uh, in all those questions. During the error validation, it was an intensive, lots of uh, video calls already um, between the lab, the genotyping lab, uh, which is EFN in Germany, uh, between Fabian and between us, but they ended up in, uh, I think, uh, general positive results. We had to do some changes compared to what we were uh, doing um, before in our in-house uh, processes and in-house pi in pipelines. Uh, we had to uh, learn that uh, we have to keep the sample, sample throughput, throughput under control because um, the genotype, the Swiss cow array is in genotyped in 96 format. So uh, depending on the facilities at the lab, uh, you have to keep the samples uh, shipped weekly uh, under control. But in the end, uh, we ended up at high quality uh, and very promising results for uh, further uh, analysis. And I showed some, uh, hopefully, in the slide. What we are doing now, uh, we have been, uh, uh, in summer 2020, we have been starting to design an LD array, which is mainly due to the fact that we want to increase the sample throughput uh, per week, um, because this LD array is genotyped in 386 format. Uh, we have been uh, submitting the array uh, in July, and now we are running and uh, we are running the, the validation uh, steps quite similar to what we have been, what, what I have been uh, showing in this talk. Uh, thank you for your attention, and thank you uh, to all the colleagues who have uh, been doing any uh, contribution to this uh, talk. And I'm happy to take any questions.